The next speaker is uh, Professor Naresh Dadich. <coughs> so he'll be talking on fundamental forces and their dynamics. So first of all, I would like to thank my friends, the organizers, for inviting me to this wonderful meeting, celebrating Bal's 85th birthday. So many congratulations and the best wishes, Bal. Well, I am a slightly uh, outlier for this community. Uh, <coughs> I am a classical general relativist. So, but I ran into some of these my friends. We actually our my main contact with this community that uh, around 2000. We started a small meeting called the Field Theoretic Aspect of Gravity, which brought the, the high energy field theorists and the gravity people together. And that's how my thing. Then Baal, I have run into one of those meetings and sometimes when we uh, happen to cross our lines in this institute at the Math science. So it's once again a very warm greetings to you. <clears throat> now today I'm going to talk about the fundamental forces and their dynamics. So the basic idea is that the, the fundamental force should distinguish, should distinguish itself from all other forces. And and so I thought is that its dynamics should not be prescribed, but should really follow from some basic general principles. Oh. How does it go further? Oh, oh. 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 okay. <clears throat> So that's the point I want to say. And the general principle could be there's some conservation law or some geometry, which is a universal principle. Now, going back to our class, the famous Newton's law or the Coulomb's law, now, they were driven by the general principle of conservation of uh, flux of the force. It's a flux conservation which gave us the inverse square laws. So, we, what we really want to see is, so in one way is to generalize, try to see what could be it's a relativistic generalization of this conservation of flux law. And that's, so we, for this, what we first let us try to begin with, that how do I define a free state of space and time as a homogeneous space time? So that's first we will go. And in this characterization of, free space time, which is free of all dynamics or forces, there will naturally arise two constants of space time structures. And now the, the fundamental force or will arise as this space time becomes inhomogeneous. So we stick back to our basic classical mechanics that the force arises only when the space time is homogeneous. Absence of the force will mean space time is homogeneous. And of course, the, you have a, the different forces probably uh, would, would, so gravity is the most uh, is the universal force which will naturally arise 
from the curvature of the space time itself. The other forces, uh, your vector gauge force forces, will arise as from the curvature of the fiber bundle space. And I will conclude with giving you an, a, a, a simplistic, rather a, a, a intuitive unified picture of all these four forces. So let's begin from the beginning. So what do we have? A free space time is characterized by space is homogeneous, which means I can freely interchange X and Y. And because nothing depends on X and Y, so I can freely interchange X and Y. And space is also isotropic. That's, but as well as time is homogeneous. Because nothing depends on time either. So what I could do for X and Y, I should be able to do the same thing for X and T. But then you say, no, you can't do this because their dimensions don't match. So that to that, my answer is the homogeneity is a general property of space time. So if the dimensions don't match, make them match. And to make them match the dimensions, I need a universal velocity so that I can interchange X and C times T. And this is how emerges the first constant of space-time structure as a universal velocity C. So now I have, once I have this universal velocity, now space and time can no longer remain uh, independent of each other. So this universal velocity binds space and time together into space time. <clears throat> That's right. The next question then comes about is, if that is the case, then we should ask, so this is how we say is, the space time is, free space time is homogeneous. Now, what should be the its geometry? And the answer to this is that the, its geometry must also be homogeneous. Geometry is characterized by the Riemann curvature. So Riemann curvature must be homogeneous, or which means it should be covariantly constant. So I should be able to express, write Riemann curvature in terms of something which is constant relative to covariant derivative. And that, of course, is the metric. So we write, so that we, so the homogeneous space time is a space time of constant curvature, lambda. And that's how arises the second constant of space time structure. As the, as the lambda, a constant curvature. So a free space time free of all dynamics is a space time of constant curvature, not necessarily of zero curvature. Zero curvature is your imposition. So zero curvature is admitted because lambda could be positive, zero or negative, but in general, this is the most general thing you have. And, and so these, the lambda emerges as the second constant of space-time structure on the same footing as the velocity of light, which from the homogeneity of space-time. Space and these are the two constants 
which emerge without reference to any force or any dynamics. So these are really the constants of free space, free space time. And these are the two most fundamental constants. Because no other constant has been synthesized, has become a part of the space time structure. <clears throat> So now next question here comes is, what happens when space-time becomes inhomogeneous? And of course the answer was obvious. When it becomes inhomogeneous, it, it indicates a presence of a force. Now, how to determine its dynamics? What determines the dynamics? Again, we say its dynamics has to be determined by the, the space-time itself, or that is the space-time curvature. Now, we know in differential geometry, this celebrated theorem, that d squared is identically zero. The properly defined derivative, double derivative vanishes. And this, John Wheeler famously described as the boundary of a boundary is zero. And of course, our familiar examples of this, we all knew without really realize that this is a, a property of a differential geometry that curl of a gradient is zero divergence of a curl in zero. So now we go as a, a higher order cousin of this, and that is to say the Bianchi derivative of anti-smitherized covariant derivative Riemann curvature is zero. So that is, this all comes, is given by the differential geometry. Now, if you have any tensor equation, or any tensor relation, the simplest thing you can do is you can play with it, contract it, take its trace, and see whether do you get something uh, non-trivial. So take the trace of the Bianchi derivative, and that gives us a second rank symmetric tensor, GAB, which is composed of the Ricci tensor. The Ricci is the first contraction of Riemann. Oh, the, there is a one R vanishing here. The, there is a Ricci scalar here. <coughs> so I have, so this gives us, leads us to a second rank symmetric tensor with vanishing divergence. And this all comes from differential geometry. We, we haven't done it. Now let's to take a, a, this one slide a, a direction, a, a digression to say the universal force means the force which links to everything that physically exists. Hence, it has to be present everywhere. So it should therefore be described by some universal entity which is present everywhere and equally shared by all. Now, that entity, universal entity, which is equally shared by all, is, cannot be anything other than space-time itself. And so hence, the universal force dynamics should be described by the curvature of this universal entity space time. <clears throat> so dynamics that follows from the Riemann curvature would be the dynamics of this universal force. So now, so recalling, so I had the second order uh, second ring symmetric tensor with vanishing divergence. And so this allows me to write 
GAB as some something which is constant relative to the covariant derivative lambda GAB equal to a some second rank symmetric tensor TAB and demanding that this divergence is zero. So, so far we are completely driven by the geometry, differential geometry. We have not added any physics so far. Now let us say, can we make some sense out of this equation? I say no. <clears throat> so what do we have? This Einstein tensor GAB, which I said came through Ricky, actually through from the Riemann tensor. Now Riemann tensor is what? Riemann tensor involves the second derivative of the metric. So the GAB is equal to H second order differential operator. Like del square phi. Now, the new tensor TAB, which I have, uh, have uh, introduced, what does this new tensor do? That this new tensor TAB, it is the code for the inhomogeneity of space time. It is that which makes the space time inhomogeneous. Inhomogeneous for who? inhomogeneous for all, everything that exists in physically. So that means this TAB should represent a some physical property which is shared by every, everything. That it has, it is a universal physical property. Not that means the universal physical property which is shared by everything is energy momentum. So now if I identify TAB with the energy momentum, I have the Einstein equation. So, so we obtain the Einstein equation purely from the geometry of the Riemannian space. <clears throat> so, as a matter of fact, to be, as what we started with, we did not start ask for that we are looking for an equation of motion for gravity. What we were saying, we were first trying to characterize homogeneous space time, space time which is free of all dynamics. And then we asked the question if the space time becomes inhomogeneous then what happens? And then appears the Einstein gravity as naturally. So it purely came driven by the geometry. More clearly, critically say, would, I would say, is the geometry of the space time which dictates inverse square law of Newton. <coughs> so, <coughs> So we got the Einstein gravity, all right? Now, once we have this, <clears throat> and this, uh, yeah. so the one general principle would be that can we extend this? Of course, there is a, oh, here I am now. So geometry of a universal fundamental force, Einstein gravity, Followed from the uh, the geometry of the Riemannian space-time. Now the rim, the uh, <clears throat> the homogeneous space-time. It's we have constant curvature is maximally symmetric, and the force or dynamics for that Einstein gravity naturally arises when it becomes inhomogeneous. Now here, what does the, your textbook tell you? That absence of gravity means Riemann curvature is zero. But then you have a very paradoxical statement here. 
that the constant curvature space time, which is maximally symmetric, has no non trivial dynamics. Maximal symmetries should have should have no dynamics. In our, our, our this new perspective, what we would like to say that the space time is homogeneous when there is no gravity, and when it becomes inhomogeneous, then the space the Einstein gravity naturally arises. So there is a smooth transition from homogeneity to inhomogeneity to zero force to non-zero force. And C and lambda are the two constants of free homogeneous space-time. And they are the most fundamental, as I said earlier. OK. <clears throat> Now there is a one problem because moment I brought in lambda, there is a question comes about that lambda has a resemblance, the exact resemblance with the stress tensor or the energy moment tensor of vacuum energy, vacuum quantum fluctuation computed relative to a flat space. So then when lambda is slated against the Planck length, you get this monumental discrepancy of 120 orders of magnitude. And everybody says there is now something problem. Lambda, as we say, it arises as a constant of space-time structure, whereas the Planck length is a construction by combining three constants. And the only physical consideration of uh, motiv justification for motivation for that is that when your <clears throat> what, uh, Schwarzschild radius becomes of the same order of the comp Compton wavelength. And that's where the uh, quantum effect should come in, and that gives you. However, though a very fundamental constant gets beaten by this new construction, now the question comes about is, of course, this number we cannot accept. At the same time, vacuum energy must gravitate because the gravity is universal. Energy in any form must gravitate, must have gravitational interaction. The question then I ask is, let me just turn the question on its head, that should it gravitate through a stress tensor? With this whole problem, comparison between lambda and the vacuum energy comes, because the vacuum energy stress tensor is the same as the lambda, the lambda term. So, <clears throat> so this is the, the question. Now you might ask, why do I to make such a question? And the question which I am saying is that the vacuum energy is a secondary source. It is created by matter. Primary source of gravity is matter, which produces vacuum fluctuations, and that gives rise to the vacuum energy. So it is a secondary source. It is it is doesn't have its it doesn't have its independent existence of its own. So it's created by matter. Now let me ask: have we not dealt with such a source earlier? And the answer to that is yes. Gravitational field energy, the gravitational self-interaction is incorporated in the Einstein gravity. Did we write a stress tensor for this? The answer is no. We don't write any stress tensor for this. But 
the space, the gravitational energy, the self interaction is included. Where is it, where is it sitting? It is sitting in the curvature of three space. So if you look at your Schwarzschild solution, gravitational potential still goes as one over i, phi as one over r. The Newton remains intact. What is the difference in the Schwarzschild solution? You have the space is curved. Space part is not flat. It is the space part is, if you write the space part flat, then you will see the presence of the gravitational field energy. Del square phi will not be zero, but del square phi will be some phi dash square. And that's where it is. Now that phi dash square gets canceled out because that goes into the curving the three space. This we do not explain. 10 minutes left. Oh, oh I won't last that long. <clears throat> uh, uh, we, you do not see it explicitly because the gravity required the curvature of space time. So with the space, space got automatically here. So one has to really, really look here. So what you have, the inverse square law remains intact in GR. So now the so thing is the self interaction gravitation was included by enlargement of the framework from the flat three space to curved space time. And the vacuum energy is, is on the same footing as the, uh, your self interaction that both are secondary sources. So all secondary sources must gravitate similarly in a subtler way by enlarging the framework rather than the uh, uh, stress tensor. <clears throat> Another, just to, to give you the analogy, we have your, uh, your Newton's law. Okay? When M became zero, when we wanted to include the zero mass particle, we could not include this in the existing Newtonian framework. We needed a new framework of, of space time. Now the analog of this for the fluid is rho plus P du to equal to minus gradient. He has rho plus p is inertial density, like the inertial mass m. Whenever the inertial entity vanishes, it signals that you need a new theory. It cannot be incorporated in the existing theory. And so for the lamp, uh, for your vacuum energy, rho plus p is zero, and hence it cannot be included this. So we really need a new theory to do. Now you say, so you have to enlarge the framework. I won't know the how to enlarge the framework unless I have quantum gravity. The vacuum energy is a quantum creature, so it remains open. On the other hand, once I free vacuum energy from lambda or lambda from the vacuum energy stress tensor, this number, the vulgar number, could now be reinterpreted as simply saying that in the Planck area, the universe measures this much. Okay. <clears throat> so in this, so this, the C was measured as the velocity of light, the universal velocity. Lambda got measured in 1997 in the supernova observation after 100 years of his introduction. And <clears throat> so as a matter of fact, had Einstein followed this chain of argument, he would have made probably the greatest prediction of all times. He would have said sometime in the future, lambda will dominate over matter and the universe will experience an accelerated expansion so accelerated expansion 
should have been a prediction rather than Starling ever has. And there is absolutely no need for anything sinister like dark energy or phantom. This we keep on doing because knowing pretty well, Lambda takes care of everything. And more importantly, this monumental confusion would have been avoided, which is still going on. Okay. <clears throat> so now next we ask to that, we go to sex, a, the new other forces, how can I incorporate them but derived from the geometry? So you can have a, a fiber, fiber bundle space time where the force is not universal, but it links to a, a charge and yet a long range. So you have a jump, geometry of a principal tangent bundle, its curvature is a two form FAB. Bianchi identity is this, where the star is a host dual. The Bianchi identity tells you that the F is a curl of a vector, or that F, F is an anti-symmetric. Moment I have this, then its double divergence is identical when it's anti symmetry of F tells you the double divergence is zero. Like the earlier times, we can say that we can write that the divergence of F equal to a, a, a four current, uh, uh, which is conserved. And now, up to this again, the differential geometry identify. J with the four current, I have the Maxwell equation. So that's how that abelian Maxwell field could be incorporated uh, as it is. Uh, the non abelian thing, so now you have SU1, the abelian, now you go to the higher order, and now you redefine, generalize your definition of a derivative from the uh, to the gauge invariant covariant derivative again goes do all the same thing. The double divergence of this uh, new defined F uh, will be zero. And similarly, the con you have a conserved, generalized conserved condiment defined. So non abelian fields could similarly be incorporated uh, uh, from the, and it could be derived from the geometry of the principal fiber bundle with a non abelian engage group. This is how the dynamics of all the four fundamental forces is governed in geometry of the relevant uh, space time. <clears throat> so now to give you a, a, a farmer's, a, you, a simplistic picture of understanding these four fundamental forces. So any fundamental force is characterized by two property, its linkage, what does it link to, and it reach, how far does it go, to range in this. The so universal force, you have both A and B, that it is universal linkage and universal reach. And that, as we just now saw, is uniquely is the Einstein gravity. Now you say, we will say, the other forces should arise as I relax this property. So if I'm saying, if I relax the property A, that not the universal linkage, but to a, a particular charge, but retain the long range, then this charge has to be a bipolar, it will be a vector gauge field, and that will be the Maxwell field. These are the only two in this picture, okay, are the only two possible long range forces, the gravity and the Maxwell field uniquely.
Now you get to this, that you, uh, you relax B, that is to say, no long range, and try to retain A within the context. So I have a short range, but I have a universal linkage. So that means it's the universal linkage to all massive particles. You do that, and that will give you the weak force. Now you relax both, neither the universal linkage nor the long range. And so you, and that will correspond to the strong force. Now, for the long forces, both the gravity and Maxwell, I could get that these are the unique. Here, this is a correspondence that they will be weak or strong, but there is things remain uh, not, not unique. <clears throat> so this is leads to a, a very simplistic universal picture. Finally, what this picture suggests us, it suggests you some duality relation. <clears throat> so first thing, of course, you say the weak force we we say that uh, it, it links to all massive particles. So any particle that participates in must have a mass. So neutrino being having a non-zero mass is a part, in this picture, it would be a part of a prediction that it ought, ought to, be, it be so. Then, we see a complementarity between the electric field and the weak. The one is long range, but a linkage to a particular charge. Other, the short range, but the universal linkage to all massive particles. So it suggests you a, a duality relation between the weak and strong. Similarly, it's a duality relation between gravity and strong, because the gravity is universal, both universal linkage and the long range. Strong force is, is neither. Now, in both these cases, you have a something. Of course, you have an electroweak unification thing. Strong and weak, I think the in the String theoretic interpretation of uh, strong force. You have a zero mass spin two particle as the interacting particle. So that brings it in. Then another thing they give you your ADS CFT. Now, which I'm saying is a very notional because from my perspective here, ADS has no gravity. Yes. ADS is a homogeneous space time. And so that's, but in a, so that these are the things it opens out that it, one has, should seek such kind of a duality relation. If there is a, any new force, which in this picture probably should be a strong range, uh, a, a short range. And the other question would be, where else would you find this? One, of course, in SU3, you can go higher and higher. Or, I don't know, if, could there be in any other mathematical structure which could be explored to find a new force? Thank you.